Do you know, I've discovered over the years about conferences like this, and I've spoken at lots of them, some with thousands in, some with just a couple in, is the actual number's not the big deal. You never know. Uh, Jesus said, my father's the gardener, so you, you never know. But what is important is what will happen the year afterwards. Who will be missing? If we have this same conference next year, what gaps will there be? Who here now with their hand up as a disciple of Jesus won't be following Jesus? You say to me, nobody. But I've been around long enough to know that that is not true. It's hard to go on following Jesus. Actually, it's quite hard whether you're a leader, whether you're a young person, an old person. If we're going to go on following Jesus, how are we going to get to the end? What will really matter? Let me read you a couple of verses from the Bible. Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. We have this in treasure in jars of clay. We're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Which is the toughest of all those? Beaten around the head, persecuted? I don't think so. I think the toughest one is perplexed. If you and I are going to go on following Jesus, you young people, church leaders, older people, we're going to have to deal with that issue of, I am totally perplexed. What is going on? Somebody cracking you around the head, you can feel quite a hero for that, perhaps. Going through difficulty. But I want to share with you briefly three disappointments that you and I are going to have to deal with if we're going to get to the end without losing heart. Now, I quite understand that as I'm talking about them, many of you, especially younger ones, and I don't blame you, won't believe me. And I, I understand why you would not. It's like a couple getting married and somebody says, make the wedding vows. We will love you for richer, for poorer. And we're thinking, no way, I will always love you. Those vows will never be called in. Yeah, I don't have to make vows to you, but they will be called in. Tough times do come to every relationship and in following Jesus, it will happen. Three disappointments. If you don't believe me now, put them in your back pocket for later. Number one, disappointment with others. Other people will let you down. Other Christians will let you down. In military terms, there's something called friendly fire. And sometimes, you know what we do? We put our faith in people, and we shouldn't. We should keep our faith in God. We put our faith in so-called Christian celebrities, whoever they are. We might put our faith in our youth leader, and, uh, uh, but, and we need to look up to people. We need to respect them, but keep your faith in Jesus. The whole Bible, let me, let me try this on you. Hands up if your favorite disciple is um, John. Anybody for John? Okay, we've got one or two for John. Any for um, Thaddeus? You normally have a couple of smart Alex who stick their hands up for Thaddeus. Anybody for Andrew? Andrew is always bringing people to Jesus. Any for Peter? Anybody? There we go. Why is that? Because he failed, because, and the whole Bible is God, the perfect father, saying, these men and women apart from Jesus were broken men and women. They have feet of clay. Respect them, look up to them, sit at their feet, but don't put your faith in them. Keep your faith in God. And I'm telling you something you're going to have to deal with, and I'm going to have to deal with, if we're going to go on following Jesus, we're going to have to get used to dealing with criticism. In 1 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul says this, I will listen to your evaluation of my life, but I won't rest my case with you. That is Professor Lewis Mead's paraphrase of that. I will listen to your evaluation of my life, but I won't rest my case with you. And I'm telling you guys, as you serve Jesus, people will come up to you and they'll say, your sermons are too long, yours are too short. Why do you drive a car like that? Why are your kids like that? Why do you dress? Why? And they will make the evaluation of your life. And it's wise to listen to them a bit because they might be brighter than you. But I'm telling you there are two kinds of critics. And if you young people and us old guys are going to get to the end, we've got to keep on realizing this. There are two kinds of critics in our lives. Number one, there are those who criticize to build us up. They're on our side. They're on our team. What they say still hurts, but we need them. They will keep us from foolish pride. They will keep us from going too fast. They will slow us down. We need them. The Bible says faithful are the wounds of a friend. 
I've had friends sit down with me and share things that hurt me. It's like a kick in the guts. But I needed it. It kept me from disaster often. Faithful of the world. They're on your side. But listen, guys. The second kind of critic are not on your side. Their aim is not to build you up, but to bring you down. You will never please them. They will say, why don't you dress like this so you will? Why don't you make your sermons longer so you will? Why don't you do this? And you'll do it all the stuff. In fact, the more you fulfill their agenda, the worse they'll be. I was speaking to a lot of church leaders recently, and in the coffee break, I turn, and there's a young Anglican vicar, and he's crying. And I say, you okay? He said, no, Rob, I'm not okay. When you spoke about criticism, it moved me. I've just had a letter from a woman in my church with 34 things that are wrong with this church. And I'm the leader. He said, I just wrote back and I answered every one of them. I said, that was not a good idea. He said, why? I said, because she wasn't satisfied, was she? He said, no, she just written me another 25. You will never please her. Let her go. She's in that category. She does not have your good at heart. And guys, I'm sorry to talk to you like this because I know you, you don't. I understand why you wouldn't believe me. But I'm telling you, there used to be a phrase of people that came back from the First World War, bruised, emotionally damaged, and they were called honorably wounded. And sometimes as you serve Jesus, you're going to get honorably wounded. Your main battles won't be with those outside, but people inside the church will hurt you. And sometimes those critics will do that to you. But don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. In fact, Paul says this. One day every man will have praise of God. There's another critic waiting in the wings. That's the one that matters. Sometimes people will disappoint you. Hold on to Jesus. So that on that day, as he will, when the very enemy of your souls comes to you and says to you, why would you go on following a God whose followers could do that to you? You may say this to them. It is true they've hurt me. But I've learned this. They're not Jesus. Secondly, guys, and George talked about this a lot this morning, didn't he? If you and I are going to go on following Jesus, we've got to get ready for disappointment with ourselves. I often think of that disciple Peter. I kind of like listening to George Verwer this morning because I heard him long ago talk about the life of Peter. Peter was always getting into trouble. Always getting into trouble. Can you imagine what it must have been like if, if Peter had parents and there were school reports around? Can you imagine what it was like? Dear parent, I'm sorry to tell you that Peter ruined the transfiguration with a silly comment on the mountain. Dear parent, I'm sorry to tell you that Peter almost drowned this morning trying to get out of the boat and walk on Galilee. Dear parent, I'm sorry to tell you that the master had to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan, today. Dear parent, I'm sorry to tell you that Peter denied the master three times today. Dear parent, I'm sorry to tell you that Peter cut somebody's ear off in the garden today. The kid was always getting into trouble. And you know what George told me about Peter years ago? He said, Rob, did you realize Peter was always getting wet? I said, no, George, I didn't realize that. Peter is walking on the Lake of Galilee. And Peter says, ask, ask me to walk on the water with you. All the pictures you've ever seen. Of that little scene, show Peter up to his neck in water. But that's only half the story. Because he did walk on the water. And now it's after the resurrection. They've gone back fishing. Perhaps they're a little depressed. And, and there's a figure at the shore. They're on Galilee. And John says, because George said, love can't always see further. George says, it's the master. And they start rowing for the shore, not Peter. Peter's in the water. He's swimming for Jesus. And then you have this remarkable conversation that I feel, as an older man, so much part of. Peter is cold, and Jesus has lit a fire. There will be times in your life when you will feel cold, and you'll need Jesus to light the fire for you. And he's hungry, and there's some food, and he's lonely. I've been lonely sometimes as a Christian leader. And there's the fellowship of Jesus. And Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? 
I've tried to imagine what went on in that man's mind because I've had it in my own mind. I do love you. I know I got it wrong on the mountain. I, I, I know that you had to tell me to get back. Yes, I do love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. I know I denied you. I, but I do love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep. And Peter somehow had to go on when he was disappointed with himself. And I'm telling you guys, there's many times in my life I feel a rubbish Christian. I write books on the stuff. I speak at conferences. But my only hope is that Jesus will do to me what he did to Peter. Stick his arm around me and say, Satan has desired to have you, then he may sift you as wheat. You can see the women do it. The chaff came to the top and they blew the top. Rob, that is his plan for your life. But I pray for you. I am sometimes a disappointment to my heavenly father, but I'm never a surprise to him. He wants me to be holy. Max Lucado was right. God loves you if you are, but he loves you too much to leave you. Don't sweep sin under the carpet. He wants me to be holy, but I am loved. And whatever I do, I can always come home. Guys, some of you kids, young people, forgive me. You are going to let Jesus down. And there'll be a time in some of your lives you'll be in a pigsty somewhere like the prodigal son or daughter. Might be in university, might be in a job, might be when you're 30 years old. I want you to remember this moment. Listen, whatever you do, you can always come home. You'll be in that pigsty, you'll be making up a little speech, and you'll start the long walk home, but the Father will be running towards you. No matter what you're smelling of, and he'd have his arms around your neck and he'd be saying, put a robe on her back and shoes on her feet and a ring on his finger. My boy's home, my girl's home. Remember this moment, whatever you do, you can always come home. And last, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm sorry to mention this, if we're going to make it, we've got to get ready for disappointment with God. That's not very popular for preachers to say, but you and I are not going to get the answers to every prayer we want. Didn't even happen for Jesus. Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And one hour later, he says to his disciples, the cup the fathers give me, I must drink it. Not even the Son of God gets the answer to everything he wants. Had a remarkable experience. A couple of years ago in care for the family, we took 60 parents away. They have kids with special needs. These kids are addicted to illegal drugs. They are anorexic or bulimic. They, they have emotional or uh, physical uh, challenges. And we take 60 of them away. And, and, and it's a Saturday evening. I've been somewhere on the Friday and I, I arrive to speak to them. I come to the back of the room. They're singing a hymn. I've got a message in my pocket. And suddenly the woman in front of me sinks to the chair, bursts into tears and rushes out. I go out after her. She's inconsolable. I say, what is wrong? She said, Rob, my son was a drug addict. And the dealers caught him and set him on fire. Should I begged him not to give evidence in court against them? But he insisted. But he didn't turn up at court. And the police come to my home looking for him. And I went out searching for him in our city. And I find him dead in a squat. Two men were seen running from the squat. And Rob, the police are trying to work out whether he took his life, whether he overdosed accidentally or whether he was murdered. Should I think he was murdered? And I pray with her, I comfort her, and then I go back and I sit right where you are now, in the front row. And I got my message in my pocket, and a young woman is speaking, she's about 28 years old. And she says, my husband and I desperately wanted children. And then I became pregnant. And my little girl was born, and when she was born, she was Down's syndrome. And then shortly afterwards, my husband contracted cancer, and he died. She's my little girl, six now, and, and I'm in the garden the other day with a lady from church who's not well, and I'm praying for my friend to be well, and suddenly my little girl comes out, and she puts one hand on my friend's arm, and she puts one hand in the air, and she begins praying for my friend to be healed. And guys, I'm telling you, I am sat there, and I got this message in my pocket that doesn't look anything like as good as when I prepared it. And I think, what on earth can I say to these people? And then it comes to me, and this is what I say to them. I believe it was a revelation of God. I say, some of you have disabled children, don't you? And they nod. And you wish they were well, don't you? And they nod again. But you love them anyway, don't you? And they nod again. And I think they thought I was about to say, that's how God loves you. He loves you anyway. But I didn't say that. 
I said, that's how you love God. You don't love God because everything in the garden's rosy. You love him anyway. Do you see how precious that love is to God? I know some of you have, have, have weak faith. You think your faith's rubbish. But do you see how precious that is to him? They start crying. I'm crying. We're all crying. I hear men and women say, God's blessed my home. He's blessed my business. Blessed my family. Blessed my church. Great. Don't knock that. Enjoy the sunshine. But guys, with all my heart, may I say to you, that is not the test. The test is when you say with an old prophet, though the fig tree does not blossom and there be no fruit on the vine, though the produce of the olive fail and there are no sheep in the stall, still will I rejoice in you. Can you and I hold on in that moment? Can we cope with disappointment with others, with ourselves, and even when we don't get all we want from God? And Paul says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are fading away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary trouble. is achieving for us a weight of glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen will last forever. I pray for every young person in this room, every older person, but I especially want to pray for the young, that not one be lost. In the name of Jesus, amen.